Uh, if you've been tracking with us over the last little while, we were in a series called Abide, and last week Pastor Rob reminded us that Jesus um, set the standard for abiding, that in everything he did, he remained in the Father through obedience and community and prayer and um, um, just being with the Father, one of the greatest examples of abiding. And I want us to consider today another Bible character who understood the power of abiding in God's presence. In his story, he's going to reveal a number of abiding principles that are relevant for us today. And it's in Exodus 33, and it's Moses. He's also going to teach us there are, even, there are good things that can distract us from the most important thing, and that's abiding. Uh, we established that abiding is the defined say, staying connected to the presence of Jesus. And so today I want to continue the series by joining, joining Moses. He was a man who lived out abiding. And we are, we are tempted to, to join his journey at the pinnacle of his life, uh, or the beginning of his faith, but, but learning the, the art of abiding in God's presence, above all else, was learned later. And the art of abiding in God's presence is often learned in the deep, painful seasons of life. As a matter of fact, the first abiding principle is this, faith is often forged in the deepest, most painful moments of our life. It's true, isn't it? This is a powerful lesson we must learn uh, in the body series. It's when we abide in his presence in those seasons that faith is forged. Moses wasn't parting seas or, or, or praying for a manna from heaven to feed the Israelites. No, he was standing at an intersection of his faith. It's a moment we all face if you ever wrestle with your faith. What, what, what will I choose, the abiding presence of God or, or something else? And at this point in Exodus, Moses was gone to a mountain for an extended period of time to hear from God. And the Israelites grew impatient and they began to build an idol that would be present in a more tangible way. And Aaron helps and goes along with, with it and gathers the golden items and melts it down and molds themselves an idol that was present. And God says to Moses, in verse 8, he says that they have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves idols cast in the shape of, of, of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. The perceived absence of God's presence can cause us to do some interesting things. Remember this this is the people of God building a version of God because he's absent. They are trying to make sense of God's silence. That has to be the, the temptation of anyone in any season of your life, especially in the season of pain. If God is not showing up, I have to begin building for myself something that makes sense in the middle of this silence. And so the Israelites have the audacity to ask a question in Exodus 17 at a time when God was showing up, he wasn't silent. Manna was falling from heaven, and because water was scarce, they would revert back to the same old statement, why did you bring us up out of Egypt so we could suffer like this? You said it too, haven't you? It says in verse 7 of chapter 17, is the Lord among us or not? And they're attempting to build their faith with a version of God, not the abiding presence of the true God. And every time God delayed or seemed silent, they reverted to, to, the, to placing their dependency on human efforts. It's a posture we often take. I, I look around this room today, and I see many people who have trusted God for salvation, but in critical seasons of our life, we often find it difficult to trust God when he's silent. No amens. All right. We trust God for salvation, but do we trust him when he's silent? It's not something we would verbalize, but it, it doesn't sound right, but it is seen in how we react when we don't sense his abiding presence. And this is a critical moment for the Israelites. 
God sees what's going on and sends Moses down because God's people have misinterpreted his silence for absence. They have taken their own future into their own hands, and now their faith is misdirected. As it says in verse 10, leave me alone, Moses, so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Wow, why would he say that? How tempting is this for the leader of Moses? What an opportunity for Moses to dissociate, disassociate himself from this faithless group of people who have constantly complained their way out of bondage. But Moses is a leader. We clearly see God's anger, but God is also checking the motive of Moses. There's more going on in this moment than disconnected humans and an angry God. This is a moment for Moses to lean into this covenant, promising, keeping God or the lure of self-preservation. And Moses remembers this promise from Exodus 3. He, he memorized it because the promise was given in the weakest, most vulnerable moment in his faith when God called him out of Egypt and Moses said, send me. <laughs> I, in other words, I, I don't have the skills to do what you're asking. And even more than that, I know Pharaoh, my father, he has the army, he has the people, he has the momentum, but who shall I say sent me? And it says in verse 12, God said, well, he says first, I am who I am. I am sent you. And he says this, and God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. I have that you word there bolded because it's actually not a singular you, it's a plural you. And God is saying, I will bring you, not just you, but generations to come will know this promise. You just can't see it right now. You just can't see it right now, but I can. You can't see the promise, but just trust me and here he is sitting in a moment where the promise is being threatened but moses didn't falter moses didn't get sidetracked and he seeks god in verse 13 and reminds god remember your servant abraham isaac and uh, israel to whom you swore by your own self i will make you descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and i will give you a descendants all this land i promise them and it will be their inheritance forever what a promise hey wow and Moses is standing there reminding, You're, you are a covenant-keeping God. And God withholds his anger. Moses comes down off the mountain, and he takes the calf they made, melted it down, and make them drink it. I honestly don't know what to say about that, but, <laughs> but you can feel the moment, can't you? And what appears to be the next day in chapter 33, the Lord directs them. He says, depart from here. Notice the language not my people, you and your people who have brought up from the land of Egypt to the land which I have promised to say, saying to your descendants, I will get, give it. He's telling Moses that he keeps his promise that one day they would go into the promised land and I want, I want you to rise up and take the land. He even adds a bonus of driving out the enemy before they go. Watch how it says in verse two, I will send an angel with you. Hmm. For anyone in the room today who's trying your best to abide and it seems silent and you're tempted to fill the void with something, an angel is a good option, don't you think? Like you, they had been waiting for the promise that one day they would have their own land, their own freedom, their own houses, everything there waiting for them. God says, go in and possess the land. And take it over. It's yours. I will drive out the enemy. I will give you an angel. It will be great. Here in the wilderness, they are, they are a nation of slaves. They are in bondage. But they had a promise that God would give them a land and they would be a free people, own their own houses, own vineyards. And God says, now is the time. Go and take it. It is tempting to get distracted by the things that we think will help our faith. But it really threatens to derail our faith. It's an angel. It's good. It's needed. It's not his abiding presence, but it's a pretty good representation. If you can go with me for a moment and stand on a hill looking 
over down at the Israelites. They are getting ready to go. And it says, P.S. Moses, I don't plan to go with you. Read it. It says in verse 3, for I will not go up into your midst because you are a stubborn people. I might destroy you along the way. We, we think Moses' greatest moment as a leader was when God called him out of Egypt. Well, if that is his greatest moment, this has to be one of the greatest crises in, in the life of Moses. What would you do? You have millions of Israelites at your back waiting for you to decide. They are longing for freedom, and God is offering it to them. It's possible, you know, to have the blessing of salvation and, and what the cross did for you and lose our desire for his presence. No amens. Okay. <laughs> It's true, isn't it? When, when was the last time you craved for his presence and not just his promises? Exodus 33 is about a man whose faithful future is dependent on his faithful God, not versions or things. Moses had two choices. Choice number one, go in and receive all the blessings of the promise and an angel. Or choice number two, stay where you are. And let me tell you where you are. You're in a waste-hollowing wilderness. But of course, the presence of God is an option too. Future is unknown, God's abiding presence. Future is known without God's abiding presence. Hmm. It's a reminder to us that God allows us to venture into areas outside of his will, but it's not God's best for our life. You hear what I'm saying? You tracking with me? He is saying, you can go here, Moses, and it looks good, but a short-term gratification may not be a long-term blessing. And when the people of God heard this, it says, they mourned. They mourned. And God told them that not to wear the ornaments. Take it off. And he would decide what he would do with it. Just picture that moment. It's, it's important to note that the ornaments they wore was to remind them of their escape from Egypt. It wasn't, the, it wasn't the reminder of things or blessings. It was a reminder of the abiding presence of God in the most desperate time. But it was also a reminder of the golden calf they had just created as an option for God because he was silent. So, so a reminder of God's presence and also God's replacement. Sounds like a testimony, doesn't it? We've all been there, faith and lack of faith. And as they were taking off the jewelry, they had to be reminded of what it was like without God's presence back in Egypt. Moses took a little journey in his faith back because sometimes you have to go back and see the faithfulness of God. Amen? When you can't see or feel his abiding presence in your moment, you go back and remind yourself of his presence in your past. Their, their escape from Egypt, their, their splitting of the sea, the food, the, the success was because God was with them. And Moses' prayer, God says, I'm not going with you. Moses does what Moses does best. He prays, and not just a beginner's prayer, okay? This is not just one of those quiet prayers you pray in the morning so you don't wake your kids. This is a man who knows what is on the line. He knows the source of his success. He knows what's at stake. He stands before God in the tent of the meeting and says, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may not know you and continue to find favor in, with you. I'm going to be honest with you, church. You catch me in a weak faith, mo faith moment, my prayer may have been a little different. Maybe a middle ground prayer. God, maybe if you just could visit us on the weekends. <laughs> we'll take the angel and the promise, but maybe on the weekends or long weekends, could you come to visit? That, I, I, let's be honest, don't look at me like that because you've prayed those prayers. And God's response, Moses doesn't do what, that because he has learned something about faith when he is seeking God. He says, verse 30, I want to know your ways that I may know you. Lord, you are the important thing here. It's not your, your early morning devotional when you're, everyone is asleep. Moses understands something at the epicenter of their success. It's not about houses. It's not about lands. It's about you, Lord. I want to know you. I want to understand your ways. I want to know your heart. He understands this abiding principle. We need God's presence to accomplish God's purposes. We need his presence to accomplish what's ahead. I'm reminded of a story that I've told before that it's not my story. 
It's in 1910. A man by the name of Charles Ryan was the manager of the building where Bethesda Mission started. He heard services and, and came, and his entire family came to the Lord, and they prayed for a young girl who had tuberculosis, and when they went home, she was healed. Amen? We're not looking to re replicate past experiences, but experience the one thing that never changes from generation to generation, church, and that is the power of God. Amen. And I realize that if we are go ever going to be obedient to the assignment and the purposes of God, what he has for us, it's first realizing our limitations apart from the abiding presence of the Lord. There's no way you can do what God has placed in your heart to do apart from his presence. You hear me? There's no way you can put one foot in front of yourself. You could probably do a few, but, but, but before you know it, you are stumbling in your own sin and humanness. Uh, it, 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 it takes the power of God, amen? His need to abide in God's presence far away his desire for the promise. Apart from the presence of God, we are hopeless. Our greatest temptation will be trying to do the work of God apart from the power of God. Amen? What does it look like? It's, it's, what does that look like? It's choosing to walk into the chaos of your day without a daily abiding presence with the Lord. It's choosing to disregard praying for God's will for your life and choosing your own will. It's settling for the good in your life and not surrendering to God's best for your life. It's trying to do the assignment God has for you without the abiding presence of God. And Moses understood this principle that in order to accomplish anything ahead of him, they needed his presence. He looks back to the one reason for the success. It's a powerful moment because what made the promise ahead of them possible was the presence of God. If those two were separated, his presence and promise, it invalidates the promise. Let me, let me illustrate for you. Imagine if you've planned to take your kids to Disney World for the first time. You promised them for years. Some of you have done this. You tell them nothing about it. You budget it for 10 years. You, you go to Amazon and buy a matching Disney t-shirts for everybody and Mickey hats, ears for everyone for the, the day they, they leave. The early morning comes. You and your wife or you, whoever, go into their rooms with their T-shirts on and ears, and you wake them up and say, we are going to Disney World today. Remember, I promised, and now we're going. Get up, get up, get up. There are screams of excitement. You pack up the car and play Disney music all the way to the airport. You get out at arrivals, unpack the suitcases, and make your way to the departures and get into the security line. And when it is time to scan your ticket, you and your spouse backs away from the line. And you look at the kids and say, enjoy Disney. These are two strangers ahead of you. They're going to look after you. I promise you that you would go to Disney, go and enjoy the promise. Your kids are going to look at you and say, is there something wrong? But when you promised, we thought you would be the ones going with us. Now, if they're teenagers, they're probably saying, see you, Dad, see you, Mom, right? I know, I've been there. I've seen, I've seen the vacillation back and forth. And now, I have a feeling that your kids are not going to enjoy the attractions the same they would with you if they were smaller. The pictures with the strangers will not look the same. When you see it on Facebook, people are going to say, who's those people with your kids? You know, your kids will no doubt enjoy some of it, but it won't feel the same. Promises are not the same unless this is shared with the person who made the promise. And Moses was standing in that moment. Promise or presence? And Moses knew that God's presence always preceded his promises. And to receive his promise without his presence lacks the power of the promise. God is ne never saying to us, here is the promise, I'll catch up later. Never. Isn't it true when you, we try to get ahead of God and rush God to fulfill something in our life, the danger is that we will miss God's abiding presence in that promise. And in, 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 in that, it will lack God's timing, hear me? And it will lack God's blessing when you rush it. It's like showing up to Disney without your parents. Okay, I got the promise, but it doesn't feel the same. 
I don't feel like I have my parents' blessing. And if you have ever rushed God and made choices outside of God's plan for you, you're standing in that choice. And it feels good, doesn't it, sometimes? But something is missing. God's timing and God's blessing. When the promise of God is validated by the presence of God, it becomes a fulfilled promise. That's why Moses chooses to stay in the desert with God, in this waste howling wilderness, than live in the promise without his presence. Moses says in verse 16, what else will distinguish us from all these people? There is no fulfilled promise without his presence. You are standing in a moment of your faith, promise or presence. His presence will always precede his promise. Presence means protection, amen? Presence means fulfillment, amen? Presence means relationship. Presence means identity. Promise alone means absence of God. Promise alone means no identity. Promise alone means fulfillment of your desires. And Moses understood this, and that's why God responds, I will go with you, and I will give you rest. Amen? Amen. Moses touched the heart of God. I'm not interested in, in material possessions, but it is you. You're the most important thing in my life. Why does this change the course of God's direction? Because their need for God's abiding presence far outweighed their need for anything else. Amen? Amen? If your presence doesn't go with, not go, do not send us. Man, it looks good, doesn't it? That promise looks good. That angel looks great. I, I want to make a knee-jerk reaction and, and get ahead of God. But I'd rather stay here. If your presence does not go, do not send me. <laughs> I could stop here and say amen, we could go home. But I'm not going to, okay? Moses goes back in, in his faith journey to remind himself of who, not what, gave them success. And he asks a question that is so pivotal to ask right now in your life. If you are on the precipice or at a crossroads and you're waiting for God for an answer as you move from home to work, from work to pr the, your presence in the world, it's a question Moses asked when he, he, faced, he, he was faced with the thought of God not going with him into the blessing of the promised land. He says, how will we be distinguished from the rest of the people on the face of the earth? He knew that God's abiding presence was essential to the life and the testimony of the Israelites to the world. It wasn't laws and regulations. Presence meant identity. The temptation to take what looked like a blessing over God's presence had to be tough for Moses. To think that what identifies him in the world is blessings rather than God? See, that's the other body principle. What sometimes looks like blessings in our life can end up derailing our faith. That relationship that you're in, that's destroying you, that's not a blessing. That decision that you made because it was easier than what you should have done, it's not a blessing. Rob said last week in his message, we seek not just his guidance, but his presence, amen? Yes. Blessings don't bring fulfillment. It is the God who gives them, amen? Yes. And Moses would have none of that. Imagine the conversation Moses is having with God here. Moses is pointing out a discrepancy. He says in verse 12, you are telling me to lead these people, but you have not led me, let me know whom you will send, me, send with me. There is a discrepancy from what, what, you, what you are telling me to do and the resources I have to do it. Ever been there? God has given you a big plan, a big moment, and, and you, it, it's bigger than you, right? And, and, and you're saying, oh, uh, I, I hear you, but I don't have the resources to do that. And this is where Moses is. Moses is telling us today, I cannot accomplish this thing apart from the presence of God. I love what Jonathan Edwards said in the middle of the Great Awakening. Only God is able to do the work of God. I need to be reminded of that because I try to work out things only God can work out. Don't you look at me like that. I'm not the only one here. We are so confident in our ability and our self-sufficiency raises its ugly head. I can do this Christian thing on my own. I think I can. We can program Christianity in our lives, our families, our church. But Moses was a true leader, church. It didn't take long for him to realize only God can do the work of God. 
The only thing that separates us from others is you, Lord. And if you remove that, we are no different. He says they have their religious practices, their laws, but they don't have you. Amen. And we can get caught up in formality and miss his presence. Understand, underneath Bethesda's desire to be effective in our context for our future vision, the need for a building that not only helps those who attend here, but a building to be a tool in the city for the hurting and those in need to do things with excellence. But underneath all the bells and whistles is the undeniable presence of God who can radically change a life and, and a city. Amen? Amen? We will never be distinguished because we go to church. Thank you for coming. We will never be distinguished because we are just good people. We will never be distinguished because you know about God. It's the power of God, come on church, in our life that affects every part of it. And the key to our future is not a state-of-the-art building. It's people who are identified with his presence and then tools and resources to live it out in the city. It's about identity, not possessions. Identity, who are you? Imagine if Moses stood in front of the crowd and said, let's take a vote. If you want an angel and the promised land and all its comforts, stand over here. <laughs> go, oh, but if you want God's presence and waste hollowing wilderness, stand over here. How do you think it would look? I can see some of you moving now. <laughs> I'm willing to bet the majority of them would have taken the angel because they were riding on the coattails of a promise that was given to them. They wanted the promise, not sure about the presence. And Moses says, our identity is not in a promise. It is in your abiding presence. Now let me ask you, as the band returns, it's a formidable question, not only in the middle of this life of this church, and our vision and our faith to move forward, but it's for you personally, where you are in your faith. And I can't determine that for you. You know that the Spirit is speaking to you. And here's the question, what distinguishes you from the rest of your world? What makes us who we are is the presence of God. It's God changing the core of who you are. And in order to know God, our need for him has to be greater than anything else, church. Moses wanted God, and that is how he regained favor with God. He knew the key to fighting battles is about surrendering to him. And God responds to him, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know your name. It's not this building. It's not the good programs. As we journey through this Abide series, Moses is teaching us God is more concerned about your surrender than any destination he has in mind for you. He knows the destination. He has it checked in his GPS. It's where he's bringing you, but he is more important. Something more important is going on at the center of anything that you're going through. You're going through is God's desire to deepen your abiding in him. God was saying to Moses and the Israelites, yes, the destination is the promised land, but the real destination is your heart. What distinguishes you is a heart after me. So that when you are stuck in your own waste hollowing journey, when the promised land is out of reach and all you have is me, you have enough. Amen? When life throws you a curveball, you have me. When sickness finds its way in your body, you have me. And when you have me, you still have the promise, but you also have the promise of my presence. Amen? Amen. Should this life bring suffering? Should this life bring suffering? I still have him. The body presence. Rain came. Wind blew. My house is built on you. And church, the consistency of our body will determine the strength of our faith. You hear me? Moses realized that a common denominator in past success it was the complete dependence on him and him alone. He fought his battles by abiding, surrendering. So he teaches us this. Faith is often forged in the deepest, most painful moments of our life. 
We need God's presence to accomplish God's purposes. When the promise of God is validated by the presence of God, it becomes a fulfilled promise. What sometimes looks like blessings in our life can end up derailing our faith. You hear me? God is more concerned about your surrender than any destination he has in mind for you. And the consistency of our abiding will determine the strength of our faith. Would you stand with me all over this room? We're going to sing a song that's new, and it's called Abide. And it's, it's a very reflective song, very reflective. It will relate to you. It talks about scripture. It talks about where we are in this series. But as we sing it, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would speak to you specifically today. Amen? Speak to you specifically today in his presence. Lead us past you, Justin. For my waking breath, for my daily bread, I depend on you. I depend on you for the sun to sleep at night. I depend. I depend on you. I depend on you. Way, the truth, and the life. You're the well that never runs dry. service continues inside this morning, we want to take the opportunity to say thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate that you invite us into your worship experience and that you worship along with us. We hope that we have an opportunity to connect with you further and to be a part of your faith journey. Um, as we've mentioned already, our online bulletin is filled with resources and opportunities for you to connect. And we want to reassure you that those opportunities are both in person as well as online. So if you're joining us from Texas or BC or from Kenya, no matter where you are today, we want to journey with you and to be a part of your faith journey. So check out the bulletin and find out what those are. And we really hope we see you next Sunday.